Hey, future respiratory therapist gang, how you doing out there? I got a video for you here that I want to do. This was not a question. This is just something that came to me and I thought to myself, you know what? This shunt versus dead space concept can be challenging sometimes. And sometimes you think you got something, but you don't even know the questions to ask to really know that you know something, okay? So I'm going to approach this today from talking about shunt versus dead space obviously but i want to i want to give it to you maybe in a little different format okay so what we're going to do here is is if i was to ask you what is a shunt most of you if you're beyond your first year or first semester definitely definitely past your second semester in your respiratory care program if i was to ask you what is a shunt you would be able to tell me okay and you would say something like Perfusion in excess of ventilation. And you would be correct. Okay? If I was to ask you what is a dead space, you would say ventilation in excess of perfusion. You would also be correct. Okay? Now, that's the typical answer you get. Tell me what you know about a shunt. Oh, a shunt is perfusion in excess of ventilation. Tell me what you know about dead space. Dead space is ventilation in excess of perfusion okay most like I said past first semester definitely past second semester students can give me that but if I ask it in a different way do you truly understand what you're saying okay and do you understand what's really happening in the body and how do you figure this stuff out at the bedside as practitioners and that's what this video is all about okay so here we go if I don't ask you what the definition is if I was to ask you, what effect on your VQ ratio would a shunt have? Would you be able to tell me? If I asked you the opposite, what effect on your VQ ratio does dead space have? Could you tell me? These are questions that sometimes you don't even know that you need to ask these questions. Okay? Because they're, they're obscure sometimes. And these questions I find are much harder for students to answer as opposed to just saying what's a shunt what's a dead space right so let's take it a step further and let's let's critically think for a second so the first thing you understand is when you talk about vq you're talking about a line okay you're not talking about an absolute number you're talking about a line the vq ratio can mismatch along this line it can increase or it can decrease so what do we know to be normal well we know that a normal VQ ratio is 0.8 to 1.0 now where does that number come from right how do we know okay so you're telling me that 0.8 to 1.0 is a normal VQ ratio but how do we get that okay well let's break it down like this what's normal minute ventilation Depending on what text you're pulling from, you're probably going to say somewhere between 5 and 7 liters per minute, right? So, ventilation is the V. Perfusion is the Q, okay? So, what's normal minute ventilation? Like I said, depending on the text, you're going to say 5 to 7 liters per minute. Now, to keep this simple, I'm just going to say 5 liters per minute, okay? So, 5 liters per minute over what's normal perfusion, Again, depending on what text you use, you're going to say somewhere between 5 and 8 liters per minute for cardiac output. When we say perfusion, we're talking cardiac output, specifically pulmonary perfusion. Okay, But we can do this with cardiac output. What's normal cardiac output? You're going to say 5 to 8 liters per minute. To keep it simple, I'm going to say 5 over 5. This gives us our VQ ratio of 1, like we were talking about. Okay. Now, just like math, basic math, if either of these numbers change, then we're going to move from this one. Okay? So what effect does a dead space problem have on VQ ratio? It's simple. All you need to do is ventilation in excess of perfusion. Now, the cool thing about this is you can do it however you want to. You can increase ventilation or you can decrease perfusion. So let's just take let's just take our perfusion down to 2.5. Now look, 
our ventilation is in excess of our perfusion. And if we do this math, 5 divided by 2.5 equals 2. And that takes us to the right on our VQ ratio line. So we have an increase in our VQ ratio. Okay, now, if we flip that and we say, what effect does a shut have on your VQ ratio? Then we're going to have to do the opposite, right? I need my eraser here. So, remember, we started at 5 over 5, right? Now, let's just say that now our perfusion is going to be in excess of our ventilation. So, this is either going to go up or this is going to go down. And that will make our perfusion greater than our ventilation. Okay? So, let's just take our ventilation down to 2.5. Now, if you do the math, you get 2.5 divided by 5, and that's 0.5. So a shunt will decrease our VQ ratio. If you ever find yourself on a test with this question and you don't know the answer, but you know the definition of shunt versus dead space, then just plug the numbers in. VQ ratio means ventilation to perfusion ratio. Put a number on the top, put a number on the bottom, solve for it. If perfusion is greater than ventilation, you're going to be less than one. If ventilation is greater than perfusion, you will be greater than one. So, just to recap, a dead space increases your VQ ratio, a shunt decreases your VQ ratio. Now when we talk about this, what disease processes are we talking about? When we talk about shunt, okay, I'm just going to draw a line here. If we're talking about shunt, we're talking about things like pneumonia, and we're talking about things like atelectasis, pulmonary edema associated with CHF, those type of things cause the alveoli to look like this. So if this is an alveoli, atelectasis looks like this, right? And you got all this blood flow coming past it, but this blood flow passing it is this alveoli is not being ventilated. So you have perfusion in excess of ventilation in that region. So that's going to decrease your VQ ratio. Now, when we talk about dead space, we're talking about things such as a PE being a pulmonary embolism. We can also talk about COPD, specifically emphysema, where you have these big hyperinflated alveoli who have volume coming into them. The gas flow in the middle of those alveoli aren't able to participate with gas exchange. So that in itself puts your ventilation greater than your perfusion. And then you have typically chronic hypoxemia present, which leads to pulmonary vasoconstriction, which leads to less amounts of pulmonary capillary blood flow. So everything with COPD and emphysema says ventilation will exceed perfusion. Okay. Now with a pulmonary embolism, you're talking about something like this. A normal alveoli, vet capillaries come in here, but you have blood flow that's blocked by a blockage or a clot, and it's stopped. So obviously, ventilation in excess of perfusion, and that will increase our VQ ratio. So, fantastic, Joe. I already knew that. What do I know about clinical manifestations of these two findings? Okay, how do I know that? How do I know what's happening? Well, with a pulmonary embolism, what you're looking for, or with an increase in your dead space, what you're looking for is the use of an entitled CO2. And specifically, when you use that entitled CO2, you will get an entitled to arterial CO2 gradient. Okay? So this is the difference in your, your I'm sorry, your arterial to entitled CO2 gradient. Your arterial CO2 is always higher. So it's the arterial CO2 minus the entitled CO2. In healthy lungs, it's relatively small. Okay? It's not, not a big difference. If your arterial CO2 is 40, then your entitled CO2 should be 35 to 39. Okay, so it's very small. 
But with dead space, you will get an increase in your arterial to end tidal CO2 gradient. And you will see this in the clinic setting if you will utilize an end tidal CO2 monitor. Okay? You have to utilize these, this equipment to be able to utilize this information. So if you utilize an entitled CO2 monitor and you notice that your arterial CO2 is going up, but your entitled CO2 is going down, that creates a bigger gradient. That's an indication of a developing dead space. Okay? So you need to understand that. That will point you in the area of dead space. Now, I don't have, I'm running out of room here, but I can even further prove this because what's our dead space formula? How do you calculate? How do you have an objective measurement of dead space? You use your Paco Pico Paco formula, right? Your arterial CO2 minus your entitled CO2 divided by your arterial CO2, and that gives you your percent dead space. How do you get that? You have to have an entitled CO2 running. Okay, otherwise, you're just guessing that a pulmonary embolism is present. But when you have that objective data, then you know it's present. And you can talk about it and say, hey, I think we should suspect this. Okay, now, the other thing is, is how do we identify a shunt? Okay, well, a shunt is going to be indi indicated by a decreasing in your PF ratio, an increase in your A to A difference, and a decrease in your arterial to alveolar ratio. Okay, all of these are talking about what? Oxygenation, right? So you're having to increase your FiO2, increase FiO2, increase FiO2 to try to keep a normal oxygenation. And what that is indicative of is as you increase oxygen, FiO2 with a very small increase in arterial oxygenation, then you're talking about refractory hypoxemia. And refractory hypoxemia is your indication of a shunt. Okay? So how do we treat a shunt? We have to use positive pressure. We have to re-recruit those atelectatic areas. We have to um, increase mean airway pressure, increase PEEP, to, to increase surface area to maximize and to improve oxygenation. Okay? So those are just a few things that we're talking about. Before I wrap this up, I want to go back to one thing here, okay? And I just want to clarify this. Why does a shunt show up in our oxygenation side of things? The answer is venous admixture. This blood passes by this alveoli that's not being ventilated and it does not pick up oxygen. So that venous blood that passes through the pulmonary capillaries and past those atelectatic regions and those consolidated regions stays deoxygenated and that deoxygenated blood returns back to the left side of the heart to where it mixes with oxygenated blood. The deoxygenated blood Mixing with the oxygenated blood pulls down the concentration of arterial oxygenation, arterial PaO2, arterial O2. And that, my friends, is what we call venous admixture. Okay? Now, on the entitled CO2, with dead space, why does entitled CO2 go down? Why does our arterial to entitled CO2 gradient go up? It's because now you have O2 coming into this alveoli, but there's no blood flow. So when you exhale, this O2 goes right back out. When that exhaled oxygen enriched gas mixes with the other side that has exchanged with gas, and now you're exhaling CO2 here, but you're exhaling gas that didn't participate in gas exchange here, this oxygen dilutes the amount of exhaled CO2, and you get a decreasing entitled CO2, resulting in an increase in your arterial to entitled CO2 gradient. So shunt leads to venous admixture, which is a dilution of arterial oxygenation. Dead space leads to a decreasing entitled CO2 due to the dilution of your exhaled CO2. 
I hope this makes sense. I hope this gives you more than just perfusion greater than ventilation, ventilation greater than perfusion. I hope you get it. And I hope you're asking questions in your educational process. And I hope more than anything that your instructors are spending time with you to help you further understand these concepts. This understanding, this stuff, is the difference between an exceptional respiratory therapist and an average respiratory therapist. Don't be average. Hope you're having a great day.